This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so what is it that you're seeing on my screen? Just the big sand dune? Big yep. sand. Lots of sand. Okay, yep. good. All right. Well, everybody, we, as you know, are going to talk about uh, Poor Man's Covered Call. And the way we're going to do that is I'm going to just basically walk you through my trading plan. And uh, you'll decide whether you think it's a good trading plan or a bad trading plan. But nevertheless, that's what we'll talk about. And then I will um, also just show you some real world, real money, non-paper money results. I record absolutely every trade in my trading journal. And I'll just give you a sense of how it's done or how, you know, how well it's worked out for me. And again, you can decide whether that's good or bad. And then uh, feel free to ask any questions along the way. And um, I've done many WebExes in the past. And usually, folks, the best way to do it is for everybody to mute themselves because what starts happening is phone calls come in, coughing, uh, people start watching videos or whatever, and then just unmute yourself when you talk. But if you're quiet, obviously it doesn't matter either way. So you can do what you want. Um, so can you see this uh, Word document here that starts off with uh, Steve Zoller's trading plan up here at the top? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And is it of a good size for you? Because I've got a giant monitor here, and I can make it smaller or larger if it's not coming through well. It's okay. Good for me. Okay, good. And just so you know, um, I don't know if my background matters, but um, I was an engineer at Procter & Gamble, and I retired about 10 years ago, and I stumbled across a group called Invest Tools that I started taking investing classes from. <clears throat> And they were bought out by Thinkorswim, which was later bought out by TD Ameritrade. And in the course of doing that, I spent about literally, I mean, this most people think this is crazy, but I spent about four years trading paper money before I ever did real money as I was trying a lot of different strategies because it just seemed silly to me to lose money before I actually was sure the strategies were going to work. And um, eventually, I ended up on what I call in the money diagonals, but most people call poor man's um, covered calls or puts. So that's why that's what I'm going to talk about today. And then obviously, if you have any questions, just uh, stop me. And I'm also watching the little chat thing here if anybody wants to chat in. Does that sound okay for everybody? Or if you want something yeah. else, tell me. Sounds great. Yeah, right. Are you going to post that? Yes, I will. I'll post Ouch. it afterwards. I thought in Wonderful. case any questions came up uh, during the meeting that I needed to revise this, that I would um, just revise it before posting it. And I just thought I'd start with this. I assume this is too basic for everybody, but everybody knows the three different basic kinds of spreads. There's the vertical spread same time with different strikes. There's the calendar spread, which is uh, same strike with different times. And then there's the diagonal spread where you've got both different strikes and different times. You can do out of the money or in the money diagonal spreads, but we're talking about in the money, meaning the uh, long is in the money. Okay. And So I'm gonna, you'll see in my trading journal here that I've got a long options section. And then below that is the short options section. And then the Greeks and then some miscellaneous perspective that I think is important. So that's kind of how I'm going to go through this. And um, for the stock selection, honestly, this is just like you would do for a covered call or any other bullish, or this can be bearish trade. You, I'm not going to get into how to pick a stock. Okay, that's just not what we're going to cover tonight. But again, the point being that the stock needs to be trending. Um, that's the key point to this. 
And however you want to decide a stock is trending, that's fine. Uh, we won't get into that. And if you want to trade an uptrend, you do it with calls. And if you want to trade a downtrend, you do it with puts, which you could say is an advantage over covered calls and um, CSPs is because you can trade a bearish trend. But most people, most of the time, don't trade a bearish trend. But I'll show you one that I trade all the time. And then just like any other trade, you can use stocks or ETFs or indexes. And like anything else, it's always better if you've got something with high volume, liquid, penny increment stocks, greater than $20 a share. I mean, again, we're not going to get into how to pick stocks, but it's just the basics that you would use for anything else. The one thing that's not the same is you don't really get any advantage from dividend paying stocks in the sense that you don't get a dividend. You might believe that they're a good stock from a stock price appreciation, but you're not going to get a dividend. So that might be the one thing that's a little different. Okay. There's, I'll stop for a second if anybody has any questions, but that's a pretty simple piece. So for the long options, the way I do it, and again, the reason we're doing this is I do it a little differently than Lenny does. Um, in his talk two weeks ago, we end up getting pretty close to the same place, but I think about it really differently. So I thought I'd share how I think about it. So for my entry, I'm going to buy a long option that's about six to 12 months out, and I'm going to buy it somewhere in the 60 delta. It could be 65, it could be 70. There's no magic formula here, but the point is you want a positive delta because that's how you're going to make your money. And in the trade management, obviously, either the stock goes up, down, or sideways. So if it goes up, let's assume for a moment we're doing a bullish trade. So if the stock goes your way, when it gets up to about a 60 or 70 delta, you're going to roll the longs and you'll use the same criteria as above. You're going to roll it to a place that's about 6 to 12 months out with about a 60 delta. It might still be the same month. You may not actually roll it out. You may just simply roll it down or up. Uh, it just depends. And you'll see that if you're trading stocks that are, you know, $50, to make any money, you got to wait till they kind of get up to 70 delta. Whereas if you're trading something like SPX, when it gets to a 65 delta, you've made quite a bit of money. So it really depends on which stock you're trading and the stock price, et cetera. But again, there's no magic formula here. It's just you want the price to go up. The delta is going to go up. And at some point, you're going to want to roll it. Um, and then when there's a, if we're starting at six to 12 months out, once it gets down to three to six months, you're, I want to roll it again. I want to roll it out in time. And we're going to talk when we get down to the Greeks why I don't like having the long uh, with less than three to six months time. But um, And then you're just going to roll it out and use the same criteria we have above. Move it out to six to 12 months out with something around a, a 60 delta. Now, if we're in the situation where the trade is going our way, we've made money, there's three things that you can do with that credit. You can either add more contracts. So who knows, let's say you were trading Home Depot and you might well have enough credit to, a, to add, I don't know, let's say you started with five or 10 contracts and you may have enough credit with this roll that you can add another three or four contracts with that credit, which is great because essentially you're adding deltas. And if Home Depot in this example keeps going up, you're going to make even more money with the next increment because you've got more contracts with more deltas than you had before. So if you want to add contracts or adding deltas, you're basically saying the stock's in an uptrend. I think it's going to continue in that uptrend and I'm going to take advantage of this uptrend and keep adding, you know, deltas with my credits. The second thing you might do is if we're in the second bullet up here, 
where we have gotten kind of short on our time. You know, it's taken a while to get here. We're now down to maybe six months left. So we may have a little credit, but we're going to use it to roll it out in time so that we're buying time with that credit. Or you may just want to pocket the profit and that, that's fine too. I mean, you can do it any of those three things, but those are basically your three choices. Fundamentally though, if you want to make money, you really would like to add more contracts because that's what's really going to start. It's like anything else, you know, you start piling on more and more, it becomes an exponential curve in terms of profits. So what you're really hoping is that you're into a stock or a ticker or an ETF that's in a long-term uptrend. Every time you roll it, you're going to take those credits and add more contracts or more deltas, and you're just going to keep making increasingly larger amounts of money with uh, future rolls. So let me stop there and see if anybody has a question about that. If that, I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. You know, you buy it at a 60 delta, and when it gets up to 65 or 70, you roll it. I mean, it's not that hard. Oh my God, this is this is brilliant. Well, it's a direction. In this sense, in this sense, it's just a directional trade. Just that you use the options. You just yeah. use the options as opposed to buying it outright. You know, you you're you're reinvesting your uh, your cash, you're reinvesting Correct. your premiums into a stronger uh, long position. Nice. Well, yep. well, that is beautiful. And you also have to you also you also have to just make the assumption that it's going to continue to go up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, just as long as that assumption is true, that's fine. But what I see here is that by adding more contracts to the long position and keeping the same number of short contracts, which we haven't gotten to yet, then you're going to be protected if that thing goes to the moon. Because well, when I do it on a one for one basis, uh, if that thing goes up to the moon, then, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm I'm in danger. You know, my, my, my p and is going to go down. I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're using your profit to protect well, yourself. Well, yeah, in my case, the way I'm positioning this is I use the profit. Um, you could suddenly yourself could decide you're even more bullish on whatever this ticker is than you were before. So you may want to not use the uh, casino's money, so to speak, but use additional money of your own. I mean, right. it really just depends on how bullish you are on the ticker that you're right. trading. Um, well, until you're not bullish anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's. I mean, that's kind of how I think about it. It's in an uptrend until it's not in an uptrend. Bingo. Uh, different people. Again, that's why I don't want to get into the stock selection because there's so many different ways to think yeah. about stock picking, you know, and, and that's just not what we'll talk about. And then the other thing is, okay, well, the trade may go against you. Um, and so it's nothing magic here either. It's like any other trade. You, you have to decide what your criteria are for getting out. Like I tend to use moving average crossovers as my way to decide to get out. Uh, some people may want to move out of a channel or you're looking at MACDs or, you know, a gazillion other ways that you can look at charts to decide to get out. Or maybe you get out when you look at the value of your long. If your long has lost half its value or your long has only lost 25% of its value or something like that. But if that's happening, it also means that the price is in a downtrend. So you just have to decide what your criteria are for the downtrend that you're going to trigger something to get out. And we're going to talk about in a minute why this is more important on a um, diagonal than it is on a covered call. Because you're going to, while you make money a lot faster, you lose money a lot faster also. And you can't, well, you could, but you don't want to just keep letting your long lose value because your profit and loss statement isn't going to look good. And um, this is one of those don't ask me how I know this kind of thing. Uh, but you um, you got to have criteria. And we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what those might be. But 
it's really critical in this to have a way to get out. So I'll stop again here. Any questions or anything on that? I do have the one. Can you tell me what is 13 EMA crosses 55 EMA? Because I don't get that. Okay. Well, I'll just, how about a picture's worth a thousand words? Okay. <laughs> so um, here's my, whoops, sorry about that. Just trying to make this a little larger. Here, oops. So let's just say I'm looking at SPY. And just for sake of argument, I'm going to put it on a six month daily chart. Mm -hmm. And I've got lots of studies saved over here. But I'm going to load a study that's a 15, a 5, 13, 55 crossover. These are just moving averages. Okay. And these are EMAs, they're exponential moving averages as opposed to simple moving averages. And the way I've got this set up is the green is the five and um, the red is the 55. But the way I'm talking about when the green, let's say to enter a position, I would want for me the green to be above the blue. So meaning the five has moved above the 13. So it's in an uptrend. Technically, I'd prefer the price to be above the 55. So you'll see in the trade that I posted um, in the website, despite my incorrect math, if you actually look at when I did these trades and the entries, I did the entry right here on one of these two candles where the candle crossed above the 55 and my five was above the 15. And you'll also see where I got out of this trade earlier on is I get out of it slightly slower, perhaps, than I get in. I get out when the 13 crosses the 55. So when the blue crosses the red is my signal that says, OK, guys, things have changed. I need to get out of this trade. And in fact, on this one, I dilly dallied around and didn't get out till somewhere around here. So I lost more at that point than I needed to lose. But the good news was I actually was paying attention and got out as opposed to letting it go all the way down to here. And so again, I happen to use moving averages because I just think they're so simple. When I start looking at the Ishimoku, you know, clouds and I start looking at Pearson's pivots and I start looking at all, you know, all the MACDs and blah, 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 blah. I just get so confused where I can just look at a moving average and it's so simple. Okay. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that believe more around a 1040 weekly crossover. So they would pull up a two year weekly chart. And people, a lot of people believe that you get in and out based on this crossover. And so again, somebody would have gotten out about right here. Uh, and this would not yet be the time to get back in for somebody who's using a 1040 weekly. But at any rate, there's lots okay. of different ways to do that. All right. Dana, Dana yeah. Just so, yeah, just so maybe just to clarify something, because I know I have difficulty with it. Uh, first thing is, uh, Steve, all I use are moving averages, too, for the same reason you do. Um, but, Dana, when, when you're looking at moving averages, um, it depends on the time frame so sure. when steve oh, you understand that that when steve yes yes, says, yes i know yeah. okay well he says five and it's on a five minute chart that's five minutes yeah that's and five. i'm on a daily chart so yeah so that's five uh, okay. days yep. okay okay uh steve yes did you say there were three moving averages and i'm seeing a 13 a 55 and what's the third one well on the it was a five Fine. Um, oh, I see you've only got two. There you go. I mean, now, people the, use people use what they call the golden cross. You know, there's there's all kinds yeah, of well, little, yeah, uh, I just need to know those uh the, the EMA numbers. Yeah, I mean, but, but like Steve yeah. said, you can you can pretty much use anything you want. Did yep. you did you back test that, Steve? No, I got this out of Invest Tools from a guy who was an absolute Fibonacci freak, if you want, 
Okay. And I know these don't sound like Fibonacci numbers. He had this convincing case that they were related to Fibonacci's. And honestly, I don't know whether they are or they aren't. I'm got, going to defend it. But I just needed something that forced me to get out of these trades at, with, based on something. And it seemed so simple to me to use that. And I just visually have looked at a lot of charts with it. And visually, it seems like it usually seems to work pretty well most of the time. Yeah, so that's okay. it sounds pretty okay. good. Great. Steve? Thanks. The yes. uh, so I see you use a 13 and a 55, but when you use three of them, what's the other one? Five, five, five. okay, Pay five attention. day, 13 day, and 55 day. And you arrived at using these from somebody who was already using them, or is it just something that you have worked from, out that is working from, well for you? from the instructor at Invest Tools who was the Fibonacci freak? Yeah, and, the Fibonacci freak. And he was convinced that these numbers and moving averages somehow related also to Fibonacci's. And I'm not going to defend whether they do or they don't. Okay, well, I'll try them. Thanks. But again, it's the my key point here really, though, is that unlike a covered call where you can just hang on to your stock, keep collecting your dividend, Wait for, you know, you may have unrealized losses, but you just, you're not taking realized losses. This is different. You got to get out. That's, yep. that's my real point here. Okay. Good okay. Point. For the short options, the real question here is to cover or not to cover. Now, a standard in the money diagonal, it can only be a diagonal. Well, no, it, it, it's standard, a poor man's covered call when you call it that is because it's got a covered call on it, just like a stock that's got a covered call on it. But there's no rule that says you have to cover it. So over the last years now, the market has been so bullish, I have been leaving my longs uncovered most of the time because you make more money. But um, you could also choose to leave the longs covered most of the time and again, when we get down to the Greeks, I'm going to tell you why that is. It's just a matter of how much money you want to make when it goes up and how much money you want to lose when it goes down. And there is no magic formula here. Uh, but if you, want to, if you want to play around with covering and not covering, which maybe you don't because it makes it more complicated, you could always be covered just like on a covered call. Let's say you might. Well, you don't have to be always covered there either, but um, where you would think about it is, let me pull the chart up again. If I were going to put on the call, sell the call, I would ideally like to sell it right here at the peak because now I would put a call on, I get a nice pullback, the call's going to deteriorate in value and I can buy it back for almost nothing. Down here would be the worst place to put a call on because if you put a call on right through here, your price is going to break through your strike almost immediately. So if you want to play with covering and not covering, you will be trying to do a bit of market timing, but you're going to try to be putting on your covers at peaks like this, and you're going to be trying to take them off down at the dips like this. And so a diagon these poor man covered calls, you can make work either way. Uh, you'll make more money if you leave them uncovered a lot, but you also won't lose as much money as if you had them covered. So it's all just a trade-off. And when I do cover, I'm covering with something like a 20 to 25 delta and or and i'm going to ideally i should say put it on at a point of resistance like let's say i'm in here wanting to cover we're down here in one of these red candles well obviously a good line to put your cover on is about right here you don't know if it's going to be resistance but you might bet that it's going to you know or if you're over here you'd like to put it at a point of resistance you know if i were going to cover right here maybe i'd be covering somewhere in this range is a point of resistance. Um, 
there, you know, again, it's like everything else when you're looking at charts, maybe, maybe they're real, maybe they aren't, but ideally you would be covering with about a 20 or 25 delta and or near resistance. And you don't, you know, you could do weeklies if you wanted to. I tend to do the monthly so that I don't have to mess with them every week. But again, it's how much effort you want to put because you get more theta burn in a week than you do in a month, but you got to mess with them more. So it's really just a matter of how much effort you want to put in and how much money you want to try to make. And the flip side is, again, it's just the opposite. You uncover it when the stock's making a bounce um, and or we'll talk about it again in a minute, but I never, ever almost never ever let options expire i believe gamma is real and i'm afraid of getting burned and so when my shorts get any option but a short gets within four to ten days of expiration i take it off but uh, if you want to risk it you can but the point is though is that when you get this close to expiration if you think it's going to expire out of the money it also has almost no value so you're taking a lot of risk to make a very few dollars and it has very little delta, so it's not protecting you very much. So usually down in this range, you know, it's being penny wise pound foolish to try to save a commission or something to not buy it back. But again, if you, if you normally let stuff expire and you know how to do that, that's fine. I don't, but um, so anyway, to summarize, I'm basically putting on a long, that's somewhere six to 12 months out with a 60 delta. I'm putting on a short with kind of 30 DTE and 20 or 25 delta. And at that level, it's really a lot like a covered call. Uh, at least your short is, because you're putting it in about the same strikes that you would. And the long is just a substitute for the stock with the big exception, as I said, is you got to get out when the trade goes against you. So let me stop at this point before I move on to the Greeks and see if there are any questions or comments. Well, I've still got burn scars from Gamma. So <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I... Gamma Gamma is also uh, a very, presents an opportunity for getting some really good premium when it comes to rolling out that short strike. Um, I, I, I'm just saying that I've been watching it, uh, like watching uh, Micron today, and um, the uh, I, I track the the credit of something I want to roll, and I want to see you know how it goes up and down, and I just mark it on the chart uh, against the uh, the intraday uh, price fluctuation. And, and and gamma can present an opportunity when it comes to rolling. So okay. I'm just saying that. All right, but, good. Yeah, but definitely, uh, yeah, I'm out within five days or four days of uh, when that short strike is uh, going to expire. Okay, I'm done. Steve? Yes. Is there any specific reason why you go out six months on the long call when you buy it yes and it's to avoid theta so let me just hit this stock this chart and then i'll come back to it again okay. i assume everybody knows what the greeks are uh but just in case you don't and we're going to come back to this but delta is the one you must understand in these trades because that's really in the end what we're trading is delta and delta means the amount of profit you're making basically on a strike for a dollar change in the price. So if the stock price goes up by a dollar and you're at a delta of 60 cents, you make 60 cents. If the if you've got a delta of 70 and the stock price goes up a dollar, you make 70 cents. Um, if or by and I say 70, you know, obviously we're multiplying by 100 and everything, but that's fundamentally delta. Um, I don't know why this slide is gamma next, but gamma is again related to delta in that when you get close to expiration, the amount delta changes, its sensitivity 
to the underlying price skyrockets in the last few days. So you may think that you're at a safe distance or that your option is down at a nickel or something and it's just going to expire. And if the ticker goes, the stock goes against you for just a few dollars, it would have made maybe no difference in the options price if you were out at 12 months. But if you're out at one day or two days, your option price will skyrocket or drop, whichever the case may be. So that's why people talk about gamma, because it really is only important in the last few days before expiration. I assume theta, everybody knows that that's the amount of, um, I'll call it daily gain or loss that an option has. But fundamentally, theta is hurting our long option because the value of our long is coming down because of theta. It's helping our short option because um, we want the short option value to come down. So when we buy it back, it'll be worth less. But theta too escalates dramatically as you get close to expiration. So Gil, to your point about why sell the option so far out, it's because when you get way out in time, your long option doesn't does not decay very much due to theta. Whereas if you let that long option get closer to expiration, it starts decaying quickly due to theta. And then you're fighting the, you know, you need the stock price to go up, but you've got theta fighting against you, pulling it down. And so if you go out a little bit farther, you just don't have to fight theta is really the reason. And you start, you know, maybe a little bit of gamma and stuff. And then as far as I'm concerned, these op I, I, I don't know even begin to know how to trade Vega in, in a diagonal. I understand Vega. I know how to use Vega for iron condors and short verticals, et cetera. I get Vega, but not in the context of these diagonals. So um, that's just a real quick Greeks overview. So then how does that come into our trading plan? I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. If you don't mind. Okay. Uh, under the dark headline, how to cover, you have a sell short uh, 20 to 25 delta. Now, on the other side of that, it says or near resistance DTE. What is uh, DTE? Days to expiration. Okay. Thanks. 30 days out. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> okay. So for the Greeks, delta. This is a delta trade. And the more deltas you've got, the more your profit and loss changes, assuming you've got the direction correct. And so what you're really trading is you've got positive delta for your long and you've got negative delta on your short, just like in a covered call. You know, stock is 100 delta and whatever the deltas are on your short. So let's just say if we were at a 60 delta on the long and a 20 delta on the short we've got a difference of 40 positive delta so if the stock goes up by one dollar your um, option value your net profit goes up by 40 cents it's really about the difference so what you don't want to then do is to let yourself get inverted meaning if your short delta is larger than your long delta, like something's happened, your short delta is now the 60 and your long is the 40, well, if the stock moves in your direction, you're actually going to lose money because you're going to be losing from the short delta more than you're gaining from the long delta. So it may sound complicated, but it's just this, this first bullet here is all you're doing is trading the difference in deltas between the longs and the shorts. So when Lenny said earlier, well, you don't have to have as many contracts with the shorts. That's right. If you've got, a, you know, if you've got 10 longs and let's just say they're at 60. So you've got 600 deltas, 10 contracts, 60 delta, you've got 600. Well, now you just subtract off whatever your shorts are. You could have one short at 50 delta. You could have five shorts at 25 each for 125 delta. I mean, it really 
it see when we look at the chart, we're looking at strikes and individual strike prices. But when you look at your profit and loss chart, all you're looking at really is the difference in deltas between the longs and the shorts. So I don't know if that seems if I'm beating on that and it's such a simple thing, everybody gets it, or if that's a, something you've never thought about before. But it's the same with a covered call or anything else. The reality is, whether you understand the Greeks or not, you're trading delta is what you're mostly trading. Trading delta and avoiding gamma. <laughs> yes. And so then, as I mentioned earlier, theta, it works for you for the short and against you with the long. And so the reason we, to your point, Gil, the reason we make this six to 12 months out is we minimize the negative theta impact with that. And then gamma we talked about, don't let it get within four to 10 days. And vega, I just don't manage vega on these diagonals at all. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions that this brought up. So if you had uh, in your example, uh, a net of 400 deltas, let's say, or whatever the net is. Right. Um, if you got, what you're saying is that if you closed both sides of that trade, you would make money? No, what it says is, is if the stock price went up by a dollar, well, since you've got a hundred shares, you know, you've, you've gotten, the stock price has gone up by a dollar. You just you made four hundred dollars basically because you got four hundred deltas. Um, it's it's the it, it's more simple to think about with one dollar. Yeah, fine. Have, we'll do it with one dollar. Let's say you know yeah. you have four deltas. Yep. And so yeah. you've got you've got a delta of forty, and it goes up a dollar. You just made forty cents. I mean, it's it's just that straightforward but what you gonna... have to close out what i don't understand is that if that's the case you you would have to close out both positions in order to well it's just like a it's like a stock it's unrealized until you close it so just like a stock that's gone from 100 to 110 you haven't actually made any money on it until you right. sell it at 110 and it's the same thing here in a sense, it's a paper profit or a paper loss, kind of, until you actually close the positions. So it's it's really no different okay. than okay. So so you'd have to yeah. No, I understand. But what I'm saying is exactly what you said. If you close the position, then you realize that gain. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now the miscellaneous perspective down here. Uh, I've said this several times, but there's a lot of trader discretion here. And I guess with every trading plan, you know, last week Gil talked a lot. Well, well, he might do it this way with this situation and might do it that way with that situation and doesn't have a hard and fast rule. It's the same thing here. You know, fundamentally, though, you got a delta trade. If you're bullish, you want positive deltas and you make money and you can lose money. And so you got to manage it. Uh, the reason this makes money, though, is this idea of leverage, because you're more or less buying or selling, excuse me, the same call that you do on a regular covered call. But instead of buying the stock, you're buying a long and the long only costs roughly a tenth as much as the stock does. Now, it depends on what delta you buy and what strike you buy. Obviously, that varies a lot. So there's no hard and fast. Here is the leverage. But it's something like that. And so I don't know, I guess all of you knew this, but that's why it's called a poor man's covered call, because the poor man doesn't have enough money to buy the stock. So he just buys the option instead. Or some people, not many, but people call it covered calls on steroids. And for that, they're calling it because of the leverage factor, because the prop P&L moves so much quicker up and down than it does with a standard covered call. Um, so that's why it makes more profit. Uh, I've already said this over and over, this second bullet here, you've gotta have clear exit rules because of this leverage factor, because it moves so quickly. And let's face it, you need to watch it more than you need to watch a covered call, because you gotta be ready to get out. 
um, and so it takes some more trade management but you're going to make five or ten times more than you will on a covered call so it's just a matter of how much effort do you want to put into these things to make five or ten times more well it's no free lunch you got to spend a little more time and effort on it well that's fair you know steve uh, yes would you consider this still a defined risk trade in other words you can't lose any more than what you paid for your uh long positions um i'm hesitating because i think you're right but i'm not sure i never worry about that because well i don't know i just i guess that's right you can't lose i think you're right you can't lose more than the what you paid because if the long value if it goes against you and you don't close it out, it just eventually goes to zero. So you yeah. would have lost what you paid for the long. And um, the short, again, if, hopefully nobody's gonna let the short get, I mean, in this case, you're not looking, you don't want it to get um, called. So I think you're right. The long, you can only lose what you, paid so i yeah. guess in that sense it is defined risk yes yeah okay all right and then for this next bullet um as i said earlier the short and the long values move in opposite directions so this means if the long gains value okay you're you're got a 60 delta on the long the stock moves up a dollar you made 60 cents the short let's say it was a 20 delta it lost 20 cents so you want the short to lose money. And I thought, I better say it again. So I even wrote in here, let me say it again. You want to lose money with the short because the only way the long can gain money is if the short is losing money because the deltas are in opposite directions. Now, there is a subtlety to that, just like with a covered call. If in fact the short, um, if it happens over enough time, the short theta value might come out of it and you might be able to buy back the call for a profit. But if you do, it means you didn't make very much money on the long. The more money you make on the long, the more you're gonna lose on the short. And so you gotta manage the short in that case. But it's kind of crazy because a lot of people get hung up on managing the short and, oh, I can't lose money on the short. I can't lose money on the short. You want to lose money on the short because you're making more money on the long. That's the whole point of this trade. If you didn't the have the short, you would make even more money on the long. That's why I was saying up above about whether to cover or not. And I got And so yeah, that's I why if you're at the bottom of a pullback and it's heading up, you really technically don't want to cover on it, but it's the same for a stock. If you want to keep a stock and it makes a big bullish run, your call is hurting you. It is not helping you. So well, it's the same thing basically, here. Basically, if you, if you look at this the same way you would look at a covered call, it's really the same thing. It's just, it the, amount, it's just the amount of money that you're outlaying. It is, and you really want to get out of that long if it goes against you. You know, you right. could just sit on a stock and collect dividends, but this thing right. could go to zero, as Lenny pointed out. And it will go right. to zero because eventually, with theta, when time, when your days to expiration gets down to zero, yeah, yeah. it yeah, could yeah. be at zero. Yeah, it's going to accelerate. And so um, this last bullet is kind of the, you know, I think everybody knows this and I, I should go quickly here because I need to get to the trading journal. But uh, stocks can go five ways, up a lot, up a little, sideways, down a little, down a, down a lot. So I tried to describe what happens if the stock market goes or your ticker. It's not the market. It's your ticker goes up a lot. That's when you make the most money, but you got to manage the short just what we're talking about here. You gotta get that short off of there or roll it or something because eventually you'll get inverted and start losing money. But this is your big opportunity is the up a lot. The up a little makes money 
and it's the easiest to manage. It's really as easy as a covered call because your short's probably going to be decaying and it's going to make some money. The long's going to make some money. It just kind of sit there and watch it for a while. And when you get down to four to 10 days on the short, you roll it out nice and easy. Um, you don't make a lot. I mean, you don't make as much as above, but you make more than a covered call. So it's still good. And the extended sideways market is the one that'll get you because you may never have broken your moving averages, but eventually theta starts decaying your long call and it starts losing value due to theta for an extended sideways market. And mm. so that one is harder to figure out when to get out on that one. And that's where up here where I said one, maybe one of the ways you get out is if the long has lost 50% of its value or something. This is kind of the situation where that might occur, where nothing's really going wrong, but nothing's going right. And, um, you know, my very first point up here is the stock really needs to be trending in order to make money. But, you know, that's no different than a covered call. The stock needs to be trending also if you really want to make money. But it's more so here because there's no dividend and there's theta working against you. So I'm going to stop here again. We've got about 12 minutes left and I was going to show you my trading journal, but we ought to this is probably more important than seeing my trading journal. So um, let me see if there are any other questions here. Okay. I see the um, in the scenario for up a lot is like your 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 short call is kind of like a cat, all right? When it's making money for you and it's not going too crazy, you pet the cat. All right, and and it's very it's purring and you know it's very wonderful. When it goes up too much, it turns into a cougar. <laughs> it does because what you have that to is not friendly anymore. <laughs> yep, yep, and you just have to watch your deltas because again, as I said, your this whole trade is really about delta difference. And so as long as your positive deltas while it's going up, you're okay. But the second you switch to negative deltas. You're going to be losing money, even though you've got a supposedly bullish trade on because your short delta has gotten higher than your long delta. Absolutely. And, so, and all the more reason to pay attention to gamma. Yes. Well, and that's why once you again, if you're just not if you don't let it get down to four to 10 days, you don't have to pay attention to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. OK, so. Um, this let's see does that show up well enough i i put uh let's see we're on the die that's my covered call page on the my trading journal so i pulled up here spx i've been trading spy or spx let's see here in real money since almost continuously since march of 13 and the way this journal is set up is, let's say here, this is my long. And then here's every time I've sold or rolled the short against that long. And then once I close out the long, I start a new segment. So now I've, I, at, on May 3rd, here you can see I closed this long and I opened the next long on May 3rd. And then I sold three calls against it before I closed it on the 9th. And then I opened a long, new long on the next ninth. And then I closed it on the 15th and I opened a new one on the next 15th, et cetera, et cetera. So I started this back in March of 13. And I've been running this journal continuously. And what I keep out here is this is the, well, let me just show one more thing. So right here, this shows what the annualized return was for the combination of longs and shorts that were in this box. So in this one, there were just two entries and this was their annualized return. In this box, there were three ent entries and this was their annualized return, et cetera. And then I started capturing cumulative annualized return. And that's what these numbers are out here. So as time went by, you know, I had some losses in here too. The market goes against you. And so at some point I had, a, I was 
had an annualized return of 117. And this is where I said, don't tell me, you know, how I know that you can't let yourself, you, you got to get out because I dropped all the way down to a 12% annualized return. And then it started coming back to where right now since, well, March of 13. So we're now January of 19. My cumulative annualized return on this is right around 50%. Um, which is you, you, you don't even think about making that on a covered call. Okay. I mean, you, you aren't going to make that kind of money on a covered call. And another one that I've done was VXX. I trade it bearishly. So I started VXX in um, August of 13, but now I'm using puts because I'm trading it bearishly. And I did exactly the same thing as above. I'm keeping track of my annualized return. But you will see that way back in February of last year, I had to get out because uh, VXX, as you might know, has gone away and VXXB took over and there were no uh, options out far enough. So I had to stop. But again, at that point in time, which would have been what about three and a half years, no, four and a half years, I had an annualized return on that one also of about 50%. But let me be really clear, this is not the return in my account. This is a return on the trades itself related to all the VXX trades added together. So I will say, I'll be the first to admit for these five years that I've been doing this, I've been really proud or happy that these diagonals have been returning 50% a year, but I've only had about 20% of my account being used. I've had the rest of it in cash because I've been such a chicken, you know what, that I thought we were at a market top. And so I had such a small amount of my capital that I was really only getting about 10% a year return on the account because only about 20% was invested and about 80% was in cash. So, you know, in hindsight, I was an idiot, but um, nevertheless. How is, average, how is that, um, a, how do you, how are you calculating that AR? You're not just taking all of the well ARs and dividing it and averaging them out, I hope. Yeah, no, what I do is here, let's, this is the cumulative profit that I've right. made. Yeah. And here is the average amount that's being invested. So I'm take I am averaging because at different times I've had different numbers of contracts, etc. Yeah. So yeah, this yeah. is the amount of money at risk. And then I've got a cumulative number of days over here that I've been yeah. in these trades. So like this long was on for 191 days and this long was on for 232. I got you. I got so, you. I do the same thing. I yep. do the same thing. Yeah. So that way I can, it's probably, I'm sure if I were better at Excel, that um, that I'd be able to do a better uh, formula up here, but it's basically taking into account the total of everything since the beginning of VXX time for me. Are, so, those, uh, are those prices real time? Uh, what do you mean? Those, those stock prices where it says price, entry, Oh, that's your entry price. Okay. Yeah, so you don't really, was, what about the stock price, the current stock price? So the way I've got this set up is I'll blow it up more. Let's say here on January 18th, I entered into VXX. So here's yeah. my first row is my long and the second's the short. So the long right. was entered then. VXX was priced at 36. I entered a June of 19 because that was the longest out I could get. It's not long enough, but it was what I could get. My strike, I've got the column headers up here at the top, up in green. Yeah. yeah. So my strike was 45. It was a put. My delta was 65 at the time I entered. I entered 10 contracts. The contract price was 12.53, and for the 10 contracts, I had to pay 7.50 in commissions. Okay. So that's how I enter it. You are going to share this, right? Very nice. So the 
reason I'm well, the reason I am sharing this is I just want to give you a sense for how much money a poor man's covered call can potentially make. And I'll tell you, I made some mistakes in here. I have some big pullbacks or drawdowns because I didn't get out when I should have gotten out. Yeah. And I also didn't, my lost opportunity cost because I haven't been even remotely fully invested. So, um, you know, I've clearly uh, made some mistakes. So in fact, what I'm doing now to try to change that is I'm now gone back to doing just plain old covered calls with the quote cash in my account. Because while I've been chicken to put on these bullish diagonals, while we seem to have been at a market top, I'm not chicken to put on covered calls. So what I'm hoping to do is I look to the future, I'm hoping to continue to have 20, 30% of my account in the diagonals, making 50% a year, and then I'll have the other, whatever, 60, 70% of the account in covered calls making 10 or 12% a year, and then that'll be better than having the, you know, the other part of the account in cash. We'll see how it works. I mean, well, to be honest you know, with you, uh, Steve, that's exactly why this is. First of all, let me say this is an excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, here, here. And we all, we all should be very thankful that um, you're willing to share this information with us, uh, because this is something that um, you know people charge money for. So it's very nice of you to do that, and it'll probably come back to you in profits. Um, but that's what I was thinking of also doing is a combination of both because I, I like the ability to get the growth of the stock, which, you know, you don't get if you just do these poor man covered calls. So it's a great way to com combine both of them, I think. Well, thanks. And so I'll just say since I'm presenting, it's nine o'clock, so we probably should say the formal part is uh, is finished. So if anybody wants to get off the line, you can. And if anybody just wants to keep hanging on and asking any additional questions, you should uh, probably feel free to do that. Does that seem fair? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, all I know is I'm going to. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this recording. Or should I leave it on, guys? Should I leave, leave it, it on? on. All right, I'll leave it on. If, if people have questions, you can leave it on. If they don't, well, we'll be able to finish and you can turn it off. <laughs> I think that what I'm going to do, I'm going to just, you know, read it over, digest it, and I'm probably going to get back to you with some more questions because there's just a lot to digest at, at the moment. Yeah, so, no, um, no, yeah. that's why the recording is going to be great. We'll be able to go back and um, and go through it again. But it really was presented in a very clear way. Yeah, all uh, right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. That was nice. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I, I have I have the only uh, information the only information I really have or uh, knowledge is really with the uh, covered calls and cash secured puts and and uh, was able to understand this very well. So good. I'm glad. Yeah. Steve. Yes. Um, when you do the chart, right? You use 5, 13, and 50. Uh, do you use one year or six months or two years to look at it? Well, I'll tell you. Here, here's what I would say. Uh, I don't have a magic formula, but I think if you start with a two-year weekly chart and you put on a 1040 on the weekly chart, some people call it a 5200 it's the gro it's the golden cross so by looking at a two year weekly chart which is what i've got up here i've got a 1040 on it or you could do a two year daily chart with a 5200 but either one this is the golden cross as they talk about it and to me this is how you get a real sense of the trend of whatever ticker you're doing like i've got spy here but we could pull up you know apple or we could pull up this thing i've been trading bearishly 
uh, you have to go back a little farther than this for this. The, the, you'll see the reason I do VXX is I've been trading this bearishly going back five years. Well, you know, what I needed to learn was getting out in these parts, but, you know, printing money during these other parts. Uh, but again, any ticker you want, a two-year weekly view is not a bad thing. Um, uh, Steve? And then, Steve, just a second. Yeah, so then, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so after getting a sense for, okay, here's my two-year weekly chart, then if I'm really, for me, looking at entries and exits, I go to this 513.55, and I tend to pull it down to about six months or even three months just so I can see what's going on you know, right here at this point in time. And then I also like to look at the chart. I get six months on here. Well, this one, of course, doesn't show it, but I like to see when the, you know, when the earnings announcements and dividends and stuff. I, oh yeah, I didn't mention this because you can trade anything you want and I didn't show it on my trading journal. I could, you will see in my trading journal, I was trading individual stocks for the first year or two and I realized hey you know what I'm making a 50% annualized return just simply trading SPX and VXX that's enough money I don't need to spend time and effort doing 10 different stocks I'm completely diversified by trading the S&P 500 I don't have to deal with earnings announcements. I don't have to deal with individual stock risk. I only have to look at one chart instead of five or 10 or 15 charts. So I said to heck with it. And I just switched to SPX. Now, you know, in fact, I went through a period of ETFs in between. And I finally said, this is enough. If I can make 50% on this, I'm not going to get greedy and try to make 60 off an individual stock. But again, it's up to you because theoretically, if you pick correctly, you can pick those stocks within the S&P 500 that are going up faster than the index is going. And if you pick those correctly, you will make more money than I can make on the index. But, you know, I just decided simplicity and lack of effort and so forth was worth it to me. But you can do it on anything. This works on any kind of ticker. Steve, the only thing I want to ask you about is when you plot VXX. Do you do you think that that's do you think it's valid to plot that um, with with uh, moving averages the way you would you know a stock or and the reason I say that is uh, because of the way it's calculated. It's actually calculated off of options. It's not really you know what I mean. It's not traded no. price wise. Well, well, I don't think it's valid to do that. Well, it, it, VXX is traded. It's not VIX. VIX okay. is not traded. This is okay. VXX, which is traded. And so, yes, it's a, some kind of crazy calculation, but it's due to contango. And stocks yeah. that always go down, like there's an oil one. What is it? OIH or something? Yeah. That always goes down. Yeah. And this one always goes down due to contango. And so the price well, chart is just as valid as on any other. Yeah. I, I guess I guess I, I guess I'm just a little uh concerned about how it's really calculated because it's really it's really calculated as basic uh, basically as a percentage change of the VIX short term futures. So that's why I, I ask you that question. Well, you know, in the end, though, you're trading the deltas on it, no matter right. how it's well, calculated. Yeah you're, yeah, you're trading the deltas and the deltas do change as the stock price or whatever you want to call this, the VIX price, VXX price changes. Yeah. And so this is where I'm glad I was out. This is one of these extended sideways moves that you don't want to be trading. And this yeah. period back here, I was printing money. So. What can I say? It works. Yeah, it's great. It's great. 
I prefer your 513.55, though, to the 2040. If you look at that last chart you brought up, by the time that cross happened, it was too late. It was over. It just lags too much. It's too yeah. much of a lagger, even, yeah. even, even as an EMA. But that's just my opinion. Well, and that's why um, people will, at least I argue and do, I trade the, the shorter term crossover for going right. up. Right. But to get out, I don't want to get jerked around too much. So to get out, I look at the 13 crossing the 55 for getting out, but I look at the five crossing yeah. the 13 for getting in. Yeah. The problem so, with moving averages, I think, is, is a simple fact that stock price drops probably 50% faster than it goes up. So by the time that moving average catches the move, it's already over. Well, and that's true. And I will say it's another advantage of trading either ETFs or the index over trading individual stocks, because, of course, the whole S&P 500, when it goes down, it goes down in the SPX or the SPY, et cetera. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And, and oh, so I, what I took you, your advice, actually. I started trading IWM. Yeah. And yeah. I, I said, for some reason, did SPX, I think, rut or IWM is just as valid. And, um, you know, so I, I wouldn't argue with it in the least. Yeah, as no, long I, as the, I, I took your advice. As long as the ticker is trending, you make money and you got to follow the rules any way you do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Any other comments or questions? I had one. Now I'm trying to remember it. You got to write it down, Lenny. Yeah, you're right. Okay, well, maybe we shouldn't keep everybody sitting here with since we've run out of questions and um, probably stop the recording and no, let everybody no, we get have, to a basketball game. We haven't something. run out of questions yet. I'm just trying to. Uh, Steve, <laughs> uh, I, I am going to steal your stuff so bad. I just want to give you notice. Um, looking at the chart you're looking at now, uh, what are the two MAs that you're using? Just the two? Well, I, this one I just happened to, when Gil was talking about um, the 1040 was too slow, I pulled up a 1030 um, is all. It's just. Okay, so that was a 1030. Yeah, you know, again, okay. there's no. There's nothing, in my opinion, about this that's magic. Uh, I mean, here's one that somebody, you know, there people, a lot of people worry about the 50-day moving average, and they just simply look at is the stock price above or below the 50-day moving average. They don't yeah. even worry about a crossover. They just use a single moving average. Um, yeah, but these crossovers are really valuable for timing your entry and exit. It depends on the time frame. You really can't say that, Lenny. If well, your time frame is too long, if your time frame is too long and you're looking at nothing more than moving averages, then you're going to be, it's going to be so late that the move is over, either on the upside or the downside. Right. You but as far combination. as. You got to use a combination of time of frames and moving averages. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking for some guidelines here. And, uh, you and know, the more. Really, the it more premium, it, the more premium you can uh, bleed out of your short calls. The you know, of course, the better, and that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I think Steve has it right though when he says that he uses it really as a protection for okay. his, uh, for his long. Okay, risk management. That's very yeah. good. Yeah, I I, yep. I think that makes sense. You know, from that standpoint, it, oh, hey, it, does, it does make that? sense. What do we got here? Ichi, Ichimuku here? Yeah. <laughs> I was, I'll just let me finish. But Gil, to your comment, you yeah. can use whatever criteria you want. And the quicker you get out, the quicker you're going to have to get back in. And the more you're going to get jerked around. Absolutely. The slower you get out, the more money you may lose, but you won't get jerked around as much. And Absolutely. it's just a trade-off. You can Absolutely. do it. It all works. It's just a matter of what you personally 
how much effort you want to put into getting out and getting in and getting out and getting right. in. Or you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. This no, kind no of I mean, I can show you. I can show you a tick chart. Do you guys ever trade a tick chart? No. No, because you're not scalpers. If you guys were scalpers, <laughs> you, 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 would, you would you would you would trade a tick chart. And basically, all that is is that every time a trade is made, a tick goes. So you can set your chart for 233 ticks, for 133 ticks. So it's not time dependent. It's basically volume dependent. It's an interesting chart, but it's not really used for this discussion. But I've, I've I, studied. OK, go ahead, Gil. No, no, go ahead, uh, Steve. Just going to say I've studied this issue, Moku Cloud, Kinko Cloud. And I can tell you what all these lines do. And it may be a wonderful way to deal with getting in or out but holy cow look at that thing okay i mean it, it's just not simple you know and so uh it may be the greatest thing ever and maybe it works but oh my goodness you got to worry whether you crossed over in the yellow or the red and you worry where there's a resistance line on this line you worry whether these guys are crossed over you worry whether your price is above or below uh, jesus I mean, it's just <laughs> worry about these flat lines in here versus and whether it's wide or narrow. I mean, there's you know rules the bottom, about. You, you know what the bottom line is to all of this? I can bottom line it, I think. And that is every one of these studies, drawings, EMAs, they all depend on price movement. So if you can look at a chart and after so many years of doing this, you probably can. I know I can to some degree without any lines and tell you where the trends are. Because yeah. it's it's what you real you know, the old timers years ago, you know, they they didn't have all of this stuff. And they could see a trend without, you know, having having all of these uh, I, I, I think the brokerage houses develop these things so that we can confuse ourselves and and trade more. I was going to say, Gil, you right. said all of them depend on price. There is one that's not, and it's called this on balance volume. And right. the theory of this is, is that you can trade inflection points off of the changes in volume. So instead of looking at daily volume charts, this is some sort of smoothed out average. Right. And clearly, when it's moving down like this, this is a bullish trend. And when it bounces, it's getting bearish. And But again, when you look at this, I can just look at the price is going down. OK, the volume's going down. And now the price is going up and the volume's going up. I mean, right. to your point, Gil, I don't know how much more I see from the chart than I see from this. You know, so, in the old days, they um, called that tape reading. <laughs> yeah. They did. They did. They actually, yep. if you can, if you can read the tape, you can, uh, you, you, you get a good sense for what's going on. The only thing I do use is I will, you, I will draw Fibonacci's on my chart. I find yep. them yep. useful in combination with EMAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, and I, I've uh, done, yeah. I've drawn so many Fibonacci's over the years that it makes my head spin, and I. Yeah. Like when they bounce on the Fibonacci, there's so many lines that eventually they always seem to bounce off of one of the lines. But I never just. Well, you know what? I use I use the 50 more than any of the other right. lines. I yeah. figure if I get a 50 percent trade <laughs> bounce, we're probably going to go further down. Yeah. Yeah. But like okay. you said, that's just what I do. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, sounds like we've run out of steam. So. Okay. Uh, the only thing I want to add to this is that this is Lenny. Is that uh, you and I diverge on one point only that I can see, and that is you go a month out. Uh, I try to squeeze out as much as I can in a week. I mean, a lot can happen in a week. A whole lot can happen in a month. And so, if I can squeeze out more. Premium from a rolled short call in one week, uh, fine. Uh, I, in fact, I did that twice today. I, I got 50 bucks on uh, two trades 
just rolling it out one week. 50 bucks a week, that's pretty good. That That's a good return. So that's all I got to say about that. Well, and, and actually, I think I mentioned this, that um, weeklies are fine. You get more theta. And so you do have the potential to try to make money on those shorts. But in the same sense, because of gamma, you can get burned on them. And so, again, it's just a trade-off of how much effort you want to put in to managing these things. So I've kind of moved into the SPX with monthly shorts, and I don't have to spend nearly as much time as back when I was doing 10 different tickers, and I had my longs only out about six months or eight <laughs> months, and, you know, holy cow, the amount of effort I was putting in compared to what I put in now and the incremental return, I don't even know if it was higher because I got burned a couple of times on earnings announcements. And mm -hmm. these, the long call, if you get burned on an earnings announcement, you're going to feel it big time. Oh, yeah. So um, it's, it's really just a trade-off. Yeah, well, you you're playing with fire. Yeah, you you're have playing to avoid... with fire, and you want to wear asbestos gloves. Well, you have to avoid the earnings. You just don't. You just don't trade through them. That's all. Yeah. Well, yeah. except for these, because your long goes out a year. You no, know, here you don't have a choice. Yeah, here yeah, you don't. You don't, have you don't have a choice unless you've done like I do and just switch over to ETFs or indexes. But well, I think that's the way. I think that's the way to trade this actually, because then you avoid those earnings announcements and, you know, and yeah. news announcements and Kramer coming online and, you know, telling you something's going to go down. Yep. Yep. Um, well, and I was in, in, and so obviously I agree with you. That's what I do, but I will say on the other side of the fence, just like a stock picker, a stock picker will argue. I, I, the stock picker will say they can always beat the index because they're going to pick the stocks that are on the top half of the index rather than the bottom half. And if it were true that they could, and I'm very skeptical that they can, but if it were true, then if this top half goes up faster than the index, they're going to make more money on it. So it's kind of whether you think you can out, whether you really believe you can pick better than the index. Um, and again, you know, the old, uh, if you can't beat the benchmark, use the benchmark. And so I really do believe in the concept that you should compare yourself to a benchmark because if your trade, whether it's covered calls or diagonals or anything else, if you're not beating, just simply doing it on, you know, IWM or SPY, then why are you doing it? You ought to be doing it on SPY or IWM if you can't beat it. So, um, well, what anyway. I find funny is that when when the professionals say that they want to beat the benchmark, and I'll tell you why I find that funny. I find it funny because they are the benchmark. <laughs> they make the benchmark. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So, for us to say to beat the benchmark, all we're saying is that we're beating the so-called professionals. But for but when they say it, it kind of makes me laugh yep. because they're the ones that are creating it. <laughs> yeah 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 so okay well gil we probably should sign off i think we've yeah i'm gonna stop here. the i'm gonna stop the recording um i think oh there it is this conference will now be re